If you've ever wondered how podcasts are made, well, I'm going to tell you a trade secret. I'm in China at the factory where podcasts are mass-produced, hence factory noise. Outside the factory, all the podcasts are stacked up on pallets where they await uh, their journey to Europe and the United States in containers. The podcast you're about to hear was recorded four years ago and unfortunately the ship carrying it sank in the Mediterranean. We had to dredge it up and dry it out in the sun and although parts of it are a bit wrinkly, we think you'll enjoy it. So please listen to this podcast which is about to start now. Hello and welcome to Park Date. You might be sat on a sweaty train or in a crumbling Victorian hovel, but for the next insert number of minutes, please, we'll be taking you back to nature. Because in each episode, we'll rip up the podcast rule book and kidnap, well, lead, a different guest to their favourite local park. And there we'll talk about the things that they like to do. So pack a picnic blanket. Try saying that after a few proseccos. Our guarantee to you, lucky listener, is that this episode will contain one or more of the following. Ice cream, swings, grass, dog walkers, drunks, canoodling couples, a possible mugging and fun in the sun unless it rains. So join me, Christopher Beanland. Yes, that is my real name. And a special guest as we try to create the perfect park date. Park date people. I'm at St. John's Churchyard Gardens in Hackney to introduce this episode, which you're going to love. It features secret gardens, uh, a great guest, and a cheeky squirrel who steals a pastry. Listen till the end for that bit. This episode is with me and Lucy Bright. Lucy has worked in the music industry for many years in different roles and one of the things she does at the moment is music supervision for TV shows and films. She chooses the music and it's a great job to have and in fact I've promised Lucy that when my first movie comes out she can choose the music though I do have some songs in mind of my own Yes The Church will be on that soundtrack and some emo as well obviously Um, Lucy and I chatted about lots of things she's great uh, and she knows everybody as well Um, but some of the things we talked about were um, music and movies Lucy's worked with some great people on some great things she's done the music for the Chris Morris movie The Day Shall Come uh, State of the Union the Nick Hornby TV show uh, Shane Meadows This Is England and some uh, upcoming Shane Meadows projects um, she worked on the Kate Atkinson adaptation Life After Life which is available to watch on BBC iPlayer now and she's chosen some songs for one of the films of the summer After Sun which is uh, a debut feature from Charlotte Wells and stars Paul Mescal. It's set in 1997 and for anyone who remembers the 90s like uh, me and Lucy do, you will probably enjoy the soundtrack which includes uh, the likes of R.E.M. Blur and Yes All Saints. Um, me and Lucy will one day start our 90s indie night that we've uh, always promised to do. You should come down to it. We did a walk around uh, the Barbican's private residence gardens, which Lucy let us into because she lives there. Thanks, Lucy. If you're enjoying Park Date, as I always say, please do review. 
um, the podcast, I'm going to read out the funniest reviews. Um, so make sure they're amusing and ridiculous. Rate us, subscribe, and follow us on socials at Park Day Podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to the Barbican. This is a very special edition where we are going to go for a walk into a park that you're not normally allowed to go into if you're not a resident. Um, and I'm being guided through the beautiful Barbican and its residence parks by Lucy Bright. Hello, Lucy. Hello. How are you doing today? It's lovely to have you here <laughs> in the brutalist heaven. Brutalist heaven and duck heaven. We've just been enjoying. Heaven. We've just been enjoying hanging out with the ducks. Though there was a moment of slight jeopardy, which we're still kind of we're still kind of recover- <laughs> recovering oh, from the little. trauma. <laughs> Tell, tell, tell them what happened. Well, there was the cutest little duckling, yeah. Fluffy, following its parents around. And then it sort of went off on its own yeah. and fell over the waterfall. Fell over the waterfall. We I mean, he... We haven't seen it. I mean, he'll, he'll be fine. He's going to be fine. He'll be fine. We're going to find him. We're going to go... <laughs> exactly. We're, we're going to walk around. We'll find him. I'll put him in my pocket. We'll return him to his mum. Yeah. it will be a happy ending. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully, I can see you still in traumatised. <laughs> that's definitely the worst thing that's happened today, isn't it? It was, and, and we sort of predicted it as well. We, d- which we was, did, didn't we? We, yes. we? we were kind of watching it. It was like one of those accidents waiting to happen. Yes. You see a kid on a on a bike and they're, they're um, yeah, doing, doing something silly. But I do think there was some bad parenting. Yeah. Some lazy parenting going on. It was bad parenting, wasn't it? Because the mum and dad duck, who, well, they're over here now. Yeah. They just don't seem to mind. That Didn't they're, even notice. They're, their only duck child <laughs> has dropped off the waterfall. And what do you think about that? I mean, calling social services? Yeah. Social services. We need to duck social services. But, um, bad, bad parenting. But yeah, we will make it a happy ending. Yeah, exactly. We'll make it a happy ending. Um, so we're going to stroll. Yeah, we're going to stroll around the Barbican. People, I guess, would maybe not think of the Barbican as a place where you go to a park. But in amongst all the brutalist concrete, there's actually lots of gardens. So we're looking at the water gardens now, with the this lake and the, the waterfalls and the sunken sunken gardens. And then there's these kind of like areas with grass and trees and stuff as well so it's actually quite green isn't it i totally agree and before i moved here lucy's a barbican resident that's how we haven't just broken in barbican (laughs) resident and i i'd been coming obviously to the barbican for years decades to go to concerts theater whatever and i don't really know how i hadn't looked beyond the sort of lakeside cafe area and noticed these incredible yeah sunken gardens and and then beyond the gate the residence garden and so when i moved in and and discovered them it really felt like a secret yeah. like a g- genuine secret garden um but that's obviously also incredibly central so it's yeah like a little oasis a secret oasis let's walk over to this bit over here um because this is kind of like a place where you can you can play games and stuff, can't you? And then there's the water. There's that kind of concrete waterfall. The concrete you can waterfall. And, walk under as well. And again, I uh, I don't think I'd ever really noticed mm. it, but it works so well. It's with nice, isn't it? The concrete brutalism. Um, to have this sort of like it feels like a real moment of life, doesn't it? The, it does. the waterfall, the ducks, the the um, the garden. And and again, I'd always thought that maybe. The Barbican wouldn't be a great place for kids, but mm. actually the gardens are lovely for them. Yeah. And there's all sorts of sort of well, we can see now, yeah. and we'll uh. hear soon the the laughter of the children <laughs> in those gardens. There, it's really adorable. It is adorable. It is. Do you know, Lucy, whose footsteps we are walking in right now? Who was here recently? filming a music video oh my god so did you see him i did not see him and i couldn't believe it because i see so many things being you know filmed yeah, or they shot film here a lot of stuff so here. much here which yeah. makes sense it's so kind of um 
aesthetically pleasing yeah. and kind of and photogenic that it makes perfect sense. But no, I couldn't. But when that came out, and immediately, so yeah, we should say it's a Harry Styles, Harry Styles. video, and. Mm. Um, I don't know. You probably get pop, bitch. I don't know if you do. So I the yogurt thing. The yogurt. I was thing. reading literally. <laughs> I was reading that this morning. The only way they could do it without having crowds of yeah. of people turning up was to say, to say it was a yogurt, it was a yogurt advert. advert. So they lied to the residents and said they were yes. filming a yogurt advert. And actually, and it. I mean, again, it must have been done quite early in the morning, I think, because yeah. there was no one. It looked amazing. Yeah. It looks great. How do they find some water bubbling away under it? Um, how do they, yeah, how, how do they manage to get it so, yeah, quiet? It must have been 5am or something. It must have been, well, have been really early in the morning. Yeah. Um, but yeah, fab. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Harry. So another... Uh, Harry doing this thing, but it made me think, we're, we're just kind of walking under the concrete waterfall thing, which is why it's a bit echoey. echoey. Um, it made me think because uh, near to my house the other day, uh, they were, I, I saw loads of film trucks and I always always ask, what are you filming? Because I'm a nerd for any, any film and TV. And they told me that they were making a toothpaste commercial. So oh, now I think... Was it actually Was it toothpaste? actually a toothpaste <laughs> commercial? Or was it maybe Harry's next video or so, someone else... <laughs> Using uh, the same... Yeah, exactly. Using the same kind decoy. of... Uh, the same... Yeah. I love it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, no, in fact, we're sort of walking to the bit now where the video was shot under the... Yeah, it was under the, under the, the big, building, yeah. big kind of walkway thing, isn't it? Can we get through here to the gardens on the other side? Yes, we can. Perfect. Should we go to the bigger gardens? Yeah, or? let's do that. We'll go, to the, we'll go to the other gardens. So, there's kind of like two... Yeah, two of these kind of... Yeah, they look like parks, really, like mini parks at each side. And this is just opening the gate for me um, and have to say constantly tended by the most amazing gardeners they look after it very well so don't well they? yeah it's very very well managed um, I think this is the thing I've you know, written a few things about brutalism and I think when you have a place like this and it's looked after then exactly, it can be that's, yeah you need to you know spend money on managing estates and keeping them in order and then everyone can love love to live there um, but yeah, it's a very, very impressive place. But yeah, they filmed so much. And in fact, well, you and I first talked in Tallinn, do you remember? Yes. Tallinn, Tallinn Music Week. And I was talking to them about doing uh, maybe some kind of talk about um, brutalist architecture and music, like specifically videos that have been filmed yes. here or in Balfour Tower and there's actually loads and loads I bet there are. loads and loads so much has been filmed uh, so much has been filmed here um, yeah just going through another another little gate <laughs> um, so uh, for people that don't know Lucy is a music supervisor and uh, has worked on some great film and film and TV projects. Um, so explain to people, Lucy, kind of what you do. You, what you, the role is. You kind of choose the music for the for the film or the TV. Yeah. Show, right? So um, every project's different, but basically, a music supervisor is um, in charge of any of the music that appears in the film or TV show, yeah. and that could be anything from. Um, a song that's licensed in to uh, picking a composer to do the score, the, the original score. Um, if there's any on camera music, then yeah. arranging that. So yeah, literally anything to do with music in the project, um, it's sort of it's your responsibility. Yeah. And and the kind of the range of how creative that can be is is again quite wide because. You know, some projects you'll come on and the director already knows exactly which composer mm. and which songs they want to use and so really it's your job just to enable that and then others will be um, much more open or kind of you know, want your guidance on that so uh, as you say choosing songs, suggesting composers um, suggesting ways of kind of using music through, through the project um, but yeah it's a, it's a, it's sort of the, the anything to do with the alchemy of putting music to picture. 
And you were saying to me that it's also about kind of putting the right people together as well, isn't it? Totally. And 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 that's what I love that that matchmaking element yeah. to it. Um, when you you know you're working with a director and you suggest a, a composer for the role and, it, and they end up sort of you know falling in love professionally yeah. and um, not only is you know is the score great and, and works brilliantly but maybe they go on to work together again yeah. so um, yeah that's a that's a very uh, sort of fulfilling part of it when that works yeah I can quite imagine and you've obviously worked with some very esteemed uh, people over the years um, one of my favourites being Chris Morris of course oh the brilliant Chris Morris what was it like you worked on The Day Shall Come didn't you with That's Chris right. Morris yes what was it like to work with um, Chris on that project so that was a project where you know Chris obviously has such a strong vision for everything that he does mm. um, and and we had we, we'd met before but we had not worked together before so you know with that first time when you're working with somebody, you're sort of trying to work out how they want to you know to deal with things and 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 possibly I would have said I was even kind of nervous because I have so well, much respect for him we, that talk, we, we talked about how we were both fans so totally you, you'd met Chris well yeah I'll let you tell the story but it was a, a wee while ago wasn't it was it? Yeah. it was funny it was a, so so when we um we got to work together I had remembered that I, that we'd met mm. many years ago in fact 20 years yeah. before and, and I had, by a magic had, had a photograph evidence. of yeah. this moment and um, and it was so funny because I couldn't actually remember where it was but I had this photo and I showed him and he was so brilliant he worked out kind of like from I think he said from the the type of collar he was wearing he could work out kind of what year it was and and then he said I think it's the Blur After Show at, at Brixton Academy. And I was like, oh my God, absolutely. That's <laughs> was exactly right. where it was. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a total treat sort of yeah. to, yeah, finally get to work with so him. To get to work with him. And what, yeah, what was he like as a, as a boss? Absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Really, I mean, like I said, really strong vision, but also totally understood the sort of, mm. You know the constraints that there can be, particularly yeah. with you know budgets or whatever, and um, and he sort of allowed me, allowed me to do my job, which is you know occasionally you it's not quite like that, and really you just sort of you know you end up doing just a clearance job, and yeah. um, but he let me be quite kind of creative. Of there was, there was one song that we really wanted, uh, he really wanted, which was. Um, the Cross by Prince. Mm. Amazing. I mean, one of the greatest songs ever written. Um, and But it's Prince, so obviously it's expensive. And um, and he was really great. He's like, okay, well, let's have that as our sort of tent pole and then yeah. we'll we'll work around that with the rest of it. Um, so, yeah, it was a t just a properly positive, joyous... Um, that sounds fantastic. ...experience Pe to work with him, yeah. Pe people have such good things... Uh, good things to say about him. I was talking to uh, Michael Cumming the other week right. about his um, his film Oxide Ghosts, at, at the kind of behind the scenes of Brass Eye. Um, and uh, Chris sounds like a, a great person to work with. Obviously, he's you know fiercely intelligent and very very driven, very determined. He has a, a very very clear vision of what he wants to do. But he also seems to be a very kind. So uh, kind, so person, yeah, yeah, so thoughtful. Yeah, um, and also he really loves music, doesn't he? The, really the kind loves music. Yes, the spoof music stuff that he's done is, I think, some of the best and you know funniest. Like when he's kind of um, impersonated like Kurt Cobain or Jarvis Cocker. Uh, he gets it so <laughs> right. Yeah, or the Pixies. He did one of those as well, didn't he? It's very. Uh, very well observed. Yeah, yeah. no, total trip. Yeah. I mean, spending any time with him, whether it's sort of, you know, actively working or not, is, is such a treat. It's like, yeah. yeah, hanging out with the coolest brain on the planet. I'm very <laughs> impressed by that. <laughs> um, and, well, you've, you've been working on... Sh I've, I'm surprised you found any time to yourself recently because you've been working on a lot of things. Um, and I guess one of them 
uh, which people can go and check out now, is the Kate Atkinson uh, adaptation. Life After Life. Life yes. After Life on the BBC, which you did the music for. Yeah, yeah so I music supervised Life After Life. It was, it was one of the... It was in the sort of moment just after... Um, the really harsh lockdowns where mm. where shooting could begin again. Yeah. So we were really lucky and sort of found that window. And uh, John Crowley, the director, brilliant director, who had done Brooklyn. People have probably seen Brooklyn, which is such a wonderful film. A great movie. Um, yeah. And uh, Kate Ogborn, the producer, wonderful producer, and with House Productions. So yeah. they just it, yeah. managed to kind of grab that moment yeah. and film this really beautiful uh, story it's just um, mm. I hadn't read the book bef- before I know it's a favourite with lots of people yeah. and um, so I'm really hoping we've all done it <laughs> justice for those who love it but um, but it was yeah just it felt like the, the most amazing story particularly after Covid or yeah. sort of in the in the midst of it, I suppose, then, but you know, thinking about life after life, doing things again, would you do them differently? Yeah, um, it felt very pertinent. Um, but yes, and what I loved about it was that even in the script, which is wonderful, Bash Doran had, has written the, the script, the adaptation, she um, had already started thinking about music, right? And there were scenes written in, um that required music, a, a band and a and um, kind of marching songs yeah. for German German right. youth. <laughs> um, and and it was so immediately even from the the reading the script we got to sort of go yeah. straight into what do we want this to be and sound like and and there was quite a challenge because Bash had written a couple of songs in that amazing and it, it doesn't it doesn't often happen but uh, one song in particular that we literally couldn't find the owners of mm. and so in the end we couldn't use that particular song so so um, the challenge of course is then finding the ne- you know yeah. the replacement for that yeah. what does what do we love as much what do we what did you go for so we went for um, Kiss Me Goodnight, Sergeant Major. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is brilliant. And actually, yeah. I think I possibly even worked better than the, the original song. But um, And that was an amazing sort of uh, whole process because yeah. when you have um, music on camera like that, so this was a band, it's meant to be 1943, it's meant to be a sort of underground Soho club, gay bar. And... You, it, it, there is quite a sort of technical um, aspect to putting that all together. So, first of all, it's finding the song, we clear the song, um, and then we find the musicians. And they had cast as the singer the brilliant Joe Black from mm, Drag Race, right? Um, to be a kind of uh, female impersonated yeah. singer for the the moment. And so, my part was then to find the um, the musicians and I work with brilliant um, Bridget at Orchestrate to find uh, to find them and then I worked with Chris Egan who I worked with before who's a um, musical director and and what he does is he records a, um, a demo of the song before we shoot and then the actors and the musicians they play they don't mind they make the sound of playing but we don't use the sound from um the recording on the day they just sort of play along to the demo and then afterwards he recreates the song to match exactly what's the picture because if you record completely live with with a quite a technical scene like that it really you're sort of quite hamstrung in the edit Mm. You're constantly having to think about what matches the sound as well as the picture. Whereas if you do it this way, you get the performance, you edit freehand, as it were, and then you'll get the sound at the end. That sounds, I mean, when you watch TV, it looks and sounds yeah. like they're just performing it. But um, So that was, and we recorded it, we filmed it on the hottest day of the year last year. We were in 
an amazing venue in um, West London and those musicians were incredible because the um, Sinead, the, the costume designer, had found these incredible vintage suits for them to wear because the idea was that they were sort of musicians who that evening were professional musicians playing at a kind of a fancy nightclub and then after hours like to relax they'd come to play at this kind of underground bar so they still had their suits sort of these yeah. like super smart suits but of course because they were these vintage suits they were thick wool right. like three piece suits on, a on the hottest day of the year Not great. they were such yeah. troopers they were incredible <laughs> um but yeah but that came together brilliantly and 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 when i saw it in the edit it was like okay brilliant that yeah. i'm so pleased we did it that way it, Fantastic. yeah it's got real energy to it amazing and there's other you've been working on uh, so many other movies as well that are coming out i it's been again i think it's that sort of post-covid lockdown yeah. where suddenly lots of things have gone into production so a brilliant um film first feature for a, a director called charlotte wells charlie wells and um called after sun starring the wonderful paul mescal cool um and that is set in the kind of late 90s in um a holiday resort in turkey and it's a really beautiful film it's and that was fun going into sort of you know the, the music of 96 97 and yeah. what would be playing at this uh, this holiday resort Turkish yes. holiday resort we were so. talking about this before did you what did you get some like Dario G or uh, <laughs> Daft Punk or something what was it's going to well I don't want to give too much away cuz you'll see it hopefully yeah. when, when it comes but um yeah, but don't, yeah don't reveal there's, there's, there's definitely some things from some that classic era. kind of I will look out club, for that. European club vibe <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of others as well you've, you've been doing lots haven't you yes so the um uh, so after some will be at Cannes that will come out and then I've got Dead Ringers which is so that's a TV series and it's an it's a remake of um, the David Cronenberg film um, that had Jeremy Irons yeah. as the twin gynaecologist and this time we've got Rachel Weisz playing the twins and it's amazing it's wild it's been it's written by uh, Alice Birch who's just got this mind that you can't believe what's coming out yeah. of it and um, and that's and it's contemporary set uh, in New York and that will be on Amazon TV later in the year Amazing. so in the middle of that we, I'm in the middle of um, Tar which is a beautiful film focus features film directed by Todd Field with Kate Blanchett as um, a composer conductor so again re a real treat because obviously music's right at the centre of the story um, and so last September we had a a week in in Dresden recording and filming her conducting the Dresden Philharmonic so um yeah that's in the edit now um and Hilda Goodnadottir is doing the music for that so it's very exciting mm. um and then Shane Meadows the Gallows Pole the Gallows Pole yes yes the yeah. wonderful Benjamin Myers book which um has been adapted and, and Shane's directed and that's been shot, so we're, well, again, we're in the edit for that one. And I wonder with that one, Ben Myers, obviously a uh, former music journalist. Absolutely. It, it, is, he, is he kind of giving any of his um, I thoughts? Think definitely, I think definitely. I mean, Ben and Put I have, have spoken in. about things. And, um, he, loved, he wrote for Kerrang, didn't he? He, he did, loves rock. And, and Melody Maker, I yeah, think. And yeah. yeah, so just, yeah, he's got some fabulous ideas and he and Shane have got a lovely lovely relationship yeah. so there's yeah there's some definitely some magic happening there I can imagine <laughs> I can imagine what's um I mean do you have do you have a preference Lisa I don't think I've ever asked you this before between uh scoring something like an original score or kind of going through your record collection and choosing those kind of tunes that go go with the movie do you have like a preference That's so interesting and again i think it's probably different every time mm. and the project itself will will sort of call out for mm. one or the other um 
and I think both can work brilliantly. Yeah. Um, I mean, Shane's a really good example of more or less exclusively using existing music. Yeah. Even when it sounds like score, it probably is like with Inaudi with This Is England, you know, mm. almost all of that was pre existing Inaudi that was licensed. And he just has an incredible way of of feeling for that pre existing music that um, of what's going to work and what's going to bring everything alive. Um, it's it's a hard one because I get there on the other side. There's nothing more exciting than you know, especially picking maybe a less known song and when it works to picture and you know it maybe even kind of gets mentioned down the line as oh that was a you know a moment as it were that's very satisfying yeah and i think some <coughs> excuse me some films and tv shows are really good at digging out like sex education is one that just comes to my mind where they're, totally. they're digging out songs that maybe people don't know so much and they yeah, become an intrinsic for a younger generation exactly. it's, it's interesting yeah, yeah i agree and so matt matt biff and cara who work on on sex education mm. are amazing for that yes. yeah yeah and i think it really adds it adds something to the feel of the 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 film or the tv tv totally. show when you have a song that kind of really you know just see it almost seems perfectly written yes you always that, feel like it has yeah, been written for, for that the moment show. yes for that moment i forget the um oh dear my memory's so bad sometimes the abortion episode in the first season of sex education they had that acoustic uh song at the end which was so beautiful and powerful um and i forget yeah, who I can't think that was true. Yeah, yeah, but yes it, and it was um it was an artist who'd done i think he'd done some other um uh, some other some other things for for uh, for that show as well but i'll put all the details in there yeah no that was in that, the written description um or, or that um that brilliant on camera performance they did of um fuck the pain away yes it's wild i yes. was very very surprised exactly i haven't heard that song for so long um was that peaches yes yeah and such a great song and of course it actually and, was was used in handmaid's tale as well right um in a very yeah. different way, but then this this brilliant kind of a cappella version it was that incredible. they did on camera is yeah, it, amazing. It worked re- it worked really well. Um, yeah, it can. It, it's funny, isn't it? When I think, well, obviously you and I are both huge music lovers, and for me, um, yeah, the music has to be central. If I watch something and the music's bad, it really really turns me off. And and I think also music can make something which is <laughs> bad less bad i'm thinking of the oc for example which <laughs> which was bad but i loved it when seth would say uh oh i'm going to see death cab for cutie tonight and i was right. like oh that's cool or like i'm gonna put on modest mouse so the the music could kind of elevate um, and, I, and i think i mean i definitely but way before i even knew about how films were made or, mm. or that a music supervisor was a role or anything like that. All of those, those things, I mean, I guess John Hughes films is such yeah. a, that for me and my age, like those yeah. like 80s films, I learned so many songs through mm. watching those and discovered artists through watching those films. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, being able to be a, like a small part of that carrying on is lovely. It's really yeah. great. Some songs, when you hear them as well, they seem... <laughs> it's a very friendly squirrel has just appeared. Um, <laughs> Crazy the animal. animals here are very, very tame. <laughs> the ducks were coming right over to us, and now the, I feel like the squirrel's going to jump, jump up, up any any minute. Um, yeah, I love how some songs uh, you listen to them and, and you just think, "Wow, it sounds like it's made for a movie." Almost. Yeah. So you know when you listen to like a gris- grizzly bear song or something and just think this is kind of destined to be so cinematic in itself to- yes exactly exactly um but yeah movies have to have have to have the right song i have i have in my head one day i will make a film and you will be music supervisor obviously oh, i'm be an honor. gonna hire you um but yeah i i one of the reasons i want to do it is because i have this list of songs in my right in my head i'm like i want to have these songs and you know, I, I kind of think of the perfect uh, point point where they where they will that they will be. And in fact, even when I was when I was writing my novel, I was thinking of music to oh, go in lovely, yeah. to go in that because I feel like you know there are occasions where you need 
music to bring something to life and you know the yeah. character the characters are listening to music because that's what people And I think a lot of writers do, listen to to music while they're writing yeah. don't they I mean I, Nick Hornby is was Right that makes doing, sense it, yes yeah. Yeah. yeah um and I've, you know it's it, Shane, I think, definitely does. Is he a big music fan? Massive music yeah. fan, yeah. What does Shane like? We have quite, Shane Meadows, we're, this is. We're quite sort of um, similar age, so we've got yeah. sort of... Uh, the references are often like... So it's a lot of that kind of 80s post-punk and then through to the 90s, obviously all the kind of Manchester yeah. scene, um, Stone Roses, um, Happy Mondays, that kind of thing. And, but then he also he's also like a really big um, folk kind of music fan, right. and and that's been lovely talking you know kind mm. of throwing ideas back around yeah. that. Um, he's in fact we first met when um, I was working at a publisher and we published Gavin Clark, mm. who was Shane's best friend. He sadly died a few years ago, but amazing musician and Shane would put his music in yeah. almost all of his yeah. projects one way or another um, but but yeah Shane, and I think Shane was even in a band uh, like, we, we sometimes talk about so, and I think he was yeah he was in a band that's early on <laughs> that's interesting um, it's uh, yeah it's, it's, it's funny isn't it I think yeah music can just be so so much of a part of part of your life talking about Manchester I rewatched. 24 hour party oh, people recently my goodness. I love that film it's brilliant it's, it's the best it's really really good it's one of my favourite like music films it really say. is yeah. yeah Michael Winterbottom got that so right yes yeah oh, and everyone involved in it but I think Michael's kind of vision yeah. for it and the sort of the the tongue in cheek nature yeah. of it that really suits those characters and those those stories. It's, exactly, yeah. it works really well. And Steve, of course, Steve Coogan's just like, he's actually qu- he's actually quite good in that. He's he's quite be- <laughs> believable as the squirrel's squ- squ- getting closer and closer. <laughs> I think he's going to give me a cuddle in a second. Um, I'm steal your coffee. Yeah, he's ve- he's very believable as Tony Wilson, um, and uh, yeah, I think it's. Um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good kind of... Because I think in sort of that slightly meta way, I think he'd slightly based Alan Partridge on Tony mm. Wilson, you hadn't he? You can see he? the similarities. So I think, you? yeah, that yeah. it always came full circle for yeah. him to then play Tony. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I only met Tony once, years and years ago. It was... Um, At In The City, was it? No, it wasn't. It was actually... Um, I was working with the KLF, on uh, oh, yeah. they did a sort of year mm. 2000 project and there was a live concert and it was I mean yeah. thinking back it was, like, it was like the whole thing was bonkers in only the way that kind of KLF yeah. could be but Tony introduced the show oh. and uh, so I, I met him that night and he yeah. was oh, he was also he was like exactly how you want him to be just a, you know brilliant character and so of generous and open, enthusiastic, um, but yeah, it was back in two thousand. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> I was going to ask you as well, like, what made you um, uh, kind of move into the music supervisor area? Because you were doing other things in music as well, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, so I started out at Mute Records um, mm. and then at Warner Classics, and, and basically working in PR, mm. either in the international department or UK PR, yeah. and. When I was at Warner Classics, I I think it was the first time that I'd worked with composers who either composed for, um, spoke for film, or whose music was used in film. So people like Philip Glass, Steve Reich, George Ligeti. And, and like I was saying, I'd always loved film soundtracks, but I'd never thought about how they came about. I sort of didn't even imagine... I don't know, it sounds so stupid now saying it, but that someone had created, you know, made these scores, written them and recorded them. and So I started learning a bit more about it from working with those composers and sort of realising that there was this job. And actually, it's a, I would say in the history of film, it's a fairly new role because um, for a long time really like the director would choose the music or or the editor might help or 
um, and the producer would clear it and that was sort of it. But as it has grown into much more of a, a business, that role is now, like, I mean, there are hardly any shows made without a music supervisor on. Um, so I was learning about that, that this role actually existed and Michael Nyman had asked me to manage him so I left Warner's to manage Michael for a year and during that time it was when James Marsh was making Man on Wire and he asked Michael to score it and Michael didn't have time to score it but he said he would open up his catalogue to um, license the anything into yeah. it and kind of create a new score from existing music so that was the first moment where I, sort of, and I started working with the editor and John Bortwood, who's the music supervisor, to, to really kind of um, t- t- suggest things from Michael's catalogue, make sure they had everything they needed. And so I was, again, like learning more and more about this process. And um, after I left Michael, I, I went to work at... Um, music sales now wise music which is a music publisher it was michael's publisher and john bortwood who was head head of the film department there but also music supervised so i was really lucky to have this kind of boss and mentor who would help me get into that side of things yeah um so yeah it was a a sort of a very organic way Mm. of finding out about the, the the job as it were and then moving into it yeah that sounds um yeah it sounds like sometimes things just happen for a reason maybe it was everything fell into place at the right i think so i also think i'm i'm not uh, have or haven't been very good as or whether it's good or what but um at having a plan like a long-term plan so i'm sort of more the person who's just like things come up and I then say yes or no to them depending on whether I think they're the right you know instinctually the right thing to follow but I've never sort of set out to be yeah. um, a music supervisor or whatever it's sort yeah. of just come along in a really organic way I think it helps um, for w- whenever people ask about you know what's a good thing to do in your career I think knowing people and having relationships and having networks so true so important and you're a person that knows a lot of people and I think that's really I, important isn't it I totally agree and, and and you never know when that sort of random person you meet in a bar that sort of you know is in a yeah. was in a band or was you know something that, yeah. that you're going to need to call on them at some point exactly. to, to be involved in something and I agree even now people I've met sort of you know 20 odd years ago mm. I'll suddenly realise oh, they're the perfect person to help yeah. out with this or yeah, that's they why wrote that song that would yeah. be excellent in this you know 1996 film Ex- well and I, yeah I can't wait for that because we're always talking about 90s music I think it's fair to say we're both, both quite, <laughs> quite nostalgic <laughs> for 90s indie um, and yeah I can't I, I can't wait for that we need to make sure that we um, follow through on our our threat our ongoing threat to do a 90s night totally um, we really need to make this happen it's, yeah <laughs> um and in fact well we were talking about uh, talking about coco um which if if people don't know is a quite a famous venue in camden it used to be the um camden palace and then uh, changed changed to coco it was affected by a fire and has now been uh, reopened with a very, very glossy pri- <laughs> private members club uh, next door. But yeah, maybe that could be uh, maybe that could be the place where we do the, our nineties yeah, indie all. night. <laughs> exactly. We need to work. You're on all a, invited. Everyone's invited. Exactly. You need to come down. We need to work on a, on a name. Have we, I don't think we've. Did we think of like no? Be a name? Like, yeah, you're right. We need to think of we that. Need to It'll think be of some a name. sort of like the name of a fluffy song or something. Yes. <laughs> Something <laughs> underground, exactly. Something like that. Yeah, like Long Pig's B side or something exactly. that people <laughs> people won't know. But it's funny because I I um I I I don't know if you've noticed, uh, Lucy, but people like take fashion for example. People now seem to be wearing all the stuff that I threw away totally. in nineteen ninety eight. Um like the you know, baggy jeans and yep. Adidas stuff. It looks like <laughs> 
<laughs> people are ready to go to the hipsters. Yeah, <laughs> ready to go to Glastonbury ninety eight. So be ma- digging out my Patrick Cox loafers. <laughs> Patrick, Patrick Cox. Um, and yeah, it's it's funny. Like you get these trends in music, don't you? Like you'll have uh, kind of revival, eighties revival, or post punk revival. Maybe there'll be like a sort of mid nineties uh, mid nineties indie revival at some point as well. Who Definitely, knows? we're there. We're there for it to to be experts. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. If anyone would be experts, it would be us. Um, and um, before we go, I want to ask you a little bit about Parks. Um, do you remember? Um, when you were growing up, did you used to go to the park when you were a kid, or when you were when you were a naughty teenager? Oh my were you... God, he's actually stealing the pants. Oh my! Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> the squirrel <laughs> has just stolen our pan of chocolate, which is quite big. <laughs> he's taking it to the bushes. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that to happen. <laughs> uh, Lucy's now taking a photo of the squirrel eating the pan of chocolate. Oh, it's a video. We'll, we'll post the video so you can see exactly what's just happened. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, can't believe, I can't believe that just happened. Life gives and then it, ta- and then it, ta- and then it takes away because that pan of chocolate... It was a gift. It was a gift. <laughs> We just went to get coffee and we thought it was our lucky day. <laughs> we were given a couple of free yeah. pan of chocolates. And, and you, 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 well, you, didn't, you didn't hesitate when they asked you what you wanted. You were like, pan of chocolate. And now the squirrel's taking it. I'll buy you another one. Um, but yeah, that's, that is life, isn't it? it, it it's gives, right gives, there in a, in, gives, in a pan of chocolate nutshell. Exactly. <laughs> I can't believe you took that. I thought squirrels were supposed to eat nuts. They're all, oh, they're all back now. He's they're, an addict. Unbelievable. Um, Sorry. Parks. What were we yes. talking about? So I, I, oh, yeah, parks. Um, yeah, did you used to hang out in your local... What was your local park? So I grew up in Blackheath and uh, we had Greenwich yes. Park. Right, a great And park. yes, Greenwich yeah. Park, uh, I mean, at every stage mm. has been important, you know, when you're really little and I remember yeah. going and, you know, feeding the ducks there and, and there were the donkeys outside yeah. that you'd have the donkey rides on. Deer? No, the deer... Yeah. Really, hardly ever saw the deer. They were mm. always hiding, which was frustrating. Yeah. But um, but no, Greenwich Park means a lot to me. And then, of course, as you say, like then through your kind of teenage years of hanging out there and drinking, like, uh, climbing in after uh, mm. you know after the gates have yeah, shut yeah. and finding that way in. Um, and it's be- yeah, it's a lo- it's a really gorgeous one. So that's yeah. the one I I think of immediately. I feel that like everyone uh, I've talked to about this has quite fond memories of those teenage years when you were just you know where, where were you going to go exactly you nothing want, to do yeah nothing like, to do no exactly. money no, no money like... and a park was kind of a perfect perfect place because you didn't have to spend anything and you could just hang out with your mates and do things that you maybe weren't supposed to be doing not that I was doing any of this like smoking and stuff but people totally, were yeah. doing that and um, maybe having your cheeky beer and stuff and and, and listening listen to music as well because you can have your music loud <laughs> which you couldn't really do any, anywhere else so it's actually quite an ideal ideal place for that so I feel like yeah we have we have quite good often quite good memories of, uh, of totally that. and I but London I feel we are actually lucky considering it is mm. such a sort of you know overcrowded in many yeah. ways we're really lucky with the green spaces yeah exactly do you make it out to to this part of the Barbican a lot I guess I when the weather's it, nicer, isn't when the it chilly ni- today, yes. isn't it? Yes, when the weather's nice, it's yeah. a lovely place. And actually, it doesn't get very busy, even on a sunny day, so it's, it always mm. feels pretty peaceful. Yeah, I remember last time as well, you showed me the garden around the other side, which is... Um, the little nature reserve. The nature reserve garden. Yes. That's very cute, isn't Again, it? Again, like a proper secret, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's lots of, um, yeah, lots of greenery uh, to be found here. Um, and before we go, what are you... Um, well, I guess you've got all these... We've got enough work to do, really. <laughs> Why am I asking you that question? What are you working on next? I think you need a holiday. Um, but when you fi- when you finished all those ones, do you have any sort of um, any idea of what you're going to be doing next? Maybe a couple more films or something different. There are always those people who you know I I love working with mm. again and again, um, and you know John McClane, director mm. of Slow West. Mm. Um, his new film will be coming at some point soon, mm. and I just adore him so. Yeah. Um, and yeah, 
can't wait to work with him again. Samantha Morton, yes, who's such a just a just a special special talent in every way. And again, hopefully, I worked with her on her first film as director. But yeah, she's got things coming, so it'd be lovely yeah. to reunite with her. Amazing. Well, yeah, make sure you get um, make sure you get some holiday. Um, it's been a pleasure, as always, so much to chat to, chat to you. Thank you <laughs> for talking. Going to the nutty nature, as na- na- nutty nature, nutty nature reserve. <laughs> That's what we'll call it after this. I can't believe I can't believe that happened. Oh, before we go, um, I brought you a small, brought you a small present. Um, this is because oh my goodness, you love a little walk around London, don't I you? I do. So this is like city um, walks, London, exactly. fifty adventures are perfect. So you can have some more, uh, some more London adventures. Thank you so much. That's okay. <laughs> it was so nice to talk to you, Lucy. And so um, come again soon. I will do. I will do. And everyone needs to um, check out all the all the stuff that. Oh yes, that's please coming, do. Life after out. life. Yes, we'll Tune in we'll put the, it. BBC put it all online. Right, I'm going to go buy you another uh, pan of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Lucy Bright. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that episode of Park Date. Um, there's lots more where that came from, and there'll be more in the future as well. If you enjoyed it, please leave a review. Um, good or bad, make them funny. I'll be reading out the best ones and there'll be a prize for the one that makes me laugh the most. Name check some trees in your reviews and leave them wherever you get your podcast from. Check out our website, parkdate.co.uk and um, if you see me walking around in the park, come and say hello. I think that was the sound of someone sneezing. Um, yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. On the next instalment of Park Date, special guest, US comedian Todd Bixelby. Parking tickets. What's all that about? Yeah. Right? Parking tickets. Cars. What's all that about? Right? Women. What are they about? Right? Carrots. What are all they about? Right? Carrots. Turnips, right? What's all that about? Life. What's all that about? Right? Try it. What's all that about? Comedy. What's all that about? Death. What's all that about? Just doing anything, man. What's all that about? What is it all about?